But what we really want to be able to do is go to you know the small developer and say, look, you haven't got the platform, but why don't you use ours? You know, and then we can we can collaborate. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Apply Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by Terraleap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at terraleap.io. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my guest, Tom Simmons, who's based in London, England. He's a CEO at Immerse. Welcome, Tom. Good to have you on. Great. A pleasure to be here. And do you know what? I am speaking to you from New York City today, which is uh -huh. very exciting because I've been waiting 20 months to get back into your fine country. So uh, it's a big moment right here. back in the US. Not, not, not only virtually, but you're, you're present in, on, on the soil of the US. Uh, but it, what's interesting and what we'll dig into is maybe not always having to be present because Immerse, you guys are an enterprise VR company. VR is, is one of my own particular passions. So I love talking about it whenever I can. Uh, let's start off though. Tell, tell me the problem that you initially saw in the marketplace and still see today? The reason why I came into this business was that I saw that in the field of learning, there was a pretty miserable use of technology. And I thought this space needs shaking up, disrupting. Uh, and I thought that if I could bring to bear immersive tech, um, into this space with some solutions, I could potentially change things. Now, 10 years ago, the, there was VR, but it was the kind of VR that existed in labs and in, in the defense industry. There was no consumer VR then. But that was my kind of thinking that there's a real need to deliver engagement that is online that makes you lean forward into your laptop rather than lean back, gaze out the window, look at your watch, do something else at the same time. And so that, that, that was kind of the, the basis. And so the problem, if you like, as I saw it, was lack of engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that was fundamentally the, the problem and, and this ability to really engage virtually in a meaningful way. VR is is a tool, but it's like coming back to that root problem. Okay, how do you how do you get someone to engage more with, with training or other elements? And uh, there's been different approaches to it, but we'll we'll dig into how you guys are solving that in in a, in a moment. But I'm also always curious of of the journey uh, of of folks of how you get to where you, where you are. Uh, can you maybe just take us back? Have you been in technology? I feel like you've been in a lot of a couple different industries and and roles over over time. W what's your personal journey? Yeah, well, I was, uh, I guess in the 90s, uh, I was working for what was then the mighty General Electric uh, when it was being run by um, Jack Welsh. So learned a lot of my kind of business training uh, from, from that company and then shifted because th th that was in 2000 because the internet was just, you know, coming into sort of public consciousness, I would say. And I thought, well, look, this is a great moment to, to jump into that space. And I was fortunate enough to, to work for Sky, you know, a, uh, a, it was then a partly owned subsidiary of News Corp. And Sky had a great reputation for innovating, using digital technology in a really clever, exciting way. And so, you know, I ended up running, you know, most of the, the web business there, running websites, launching digital services. And that's where I developed my kind of love of digital technology and the love of innovating, I guess. So that whole combination of the technology, but also capturing people's interest and awareness because you're, you're on the marketing sales side of trying to capture people's uh, yeah, 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 that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I think you know, I think that's very true for, for what Immerse is today. There is incredible technology in our solution, but fundamentally it's about solving companies' problems. And yeah. some people you speak to really want to get into the weeds and understand, you know, how it all knits together, but many don't. 
they they they, they want to say, well, can you help me? You know, with, with this changing working environment, I've got everyone working from home. How can you help me solve that problem? And that that's what interests me particularly. So you, you go from GE uh, in the '90s and 2000. To, uh, the internet's put pulling up to so you join Sky, and after that, you were there for for six years. Is that right? That's right. Um, and then I then I went into another uh, digital media business, uh, the uh, Metro, free newspapers around the world, and and that was building a whole digital uh, strategy for them. And then I I kind of thought. Mm, I'd quite like to try my hand at this entrepreneurial startup thing. Sounds fun. How hard can it be? This, and of course, I got the answer for that pretty quickly. Pretty hard. This is Kublux pretty. Financial Technologies. Is that what you launched? Yeah, that's right. It was a fintech. It was a very cool, uh, brilliant idea, um, which another U.S. company called Mint. We were doing something very similar at the same time. Mint raised a lot more money than than we did, and yeah, I I, I don't want to talk about it because it just makes me sad on this call. But I learned a lot of learning, a lot of I learning. Of sure. job, and as always, those kind of painful experiences, you know, that's in many ways that's when you learn the most. And, and I was very green going into the uh, startup space. Uh, I was naive in many senses. I'd never raised money before. I'd never really taken you know, an innovative new product to market, certainly not with a tiny marketing budget. Um, so yeah, that, that was a pretty- if you, like, if you had one lesson learned there, because we have a lot of entrepreneurs and other founders that are li listening to the series. And and honestly, it's, it's the things that don't go right that you learn the most and other people can learn from too. So if you had like one lesson there that you've kind of stuck with you, uh, what, what would be one, one tip? I think one of them would be fail quickly and move on. <laughs> don't, you know, don't try and boil the ocean, you know, just get some stuff out there, test it. If it doesn't work, then move on fast. I think that's a, 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 a very key point. Uh, the, the boiling the ocean thing is a, is a tendency that some early stage companies have. And, you know, I think that's to be avoided at all costs. I think you've got to, it's, you've got to generate traction momentum, even if it's for a, a subset of the total proposition. Um, so you go, you go from, from, from that endeavor that, that launch and, and getting your feet wet. And, and then you go, I think two other things, EYs and, and customer Bryce. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, then, and then I think I was thinking, you know, you, you sort of reach that moment where you think, well, you know, Kublax was a failure. It, it, it didn't. It didn't work. Uh, do you say, okay, well, at least I tried it. I'm going to go back into cozy corporate world, or do I say, no, I'm going to give this another go because I want to prove to myself um, that I can be a successful entrepreneur. And so I, you know, and I think this is probably what many people do. They think, no, I'm going to give this another go. Because I, there's something about it, even though you feel a bit like a masochist, you know, you're thinking, do I really, because, you, you know, in those early stages of being an entrepreneur, you don't make any money. I mean, you, you take a tiny salary out of the business and, you, and it becomes very personal, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, 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 to a point where it really defines you in, in, in many ways, I would say. And so I, I was then beginning to look at this, learning education space uh, and it was clear and this was at a time when there was no such thing as ed tech you know as a term that didn't exist uh, this was probably 12 years ago i would say um and uh, as i was doing you know researching the space i came across um immersed when it was called something else when it was a it was a language learning uh, play on second life uh, and I thought, ooh, wow, this is a bit different. Uh, and it was really trying to prove that you could teach languages remotely. So you're a, you know, a, a good example would be you're a, a Saudi housewife who wants to learn English, but your husband won't allow you to go to England for two months, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, 
but he would allow you to go online, be an avatar on Second Life and be taught by another person represented by an avatar who is a, let's say, an, you know, an American English teacher. And so it was, and I thought, mm, okay, this is, this is genuinely innovative. It's, it was one of the only things I saw that was really trying to move the dial. Uh, and anyway, I got to know the founder and, and I began to sort of give him some advice. Um, and then he said to me after about six months, do you want to take this business on uh, and run it? And I thought, well, yeah, I'm going to give it a go because the central idea of marrying gaming technology with learning or live learning was a brilliant idea. It, it was a brilliant idea. And, and, and to be honest with you, much of what we are trying to deliver for our customers today is that it is the marriage of immersive tech um, in a way that is relevant um, with specific you know business objectives now second life was a really super clunky um, user experience you needed to be really patient uh, to, to engage with it lots of you know, different keystrokes. And I mean, it was, it was anything but intuitive. Yeah. But if you were willing to get into it and, and actually get into that live experience, it was, yeah, it was good. Um, so that, that, that's kind of. What year was that? Well, that, well, that was 10 years ago. I mean. Yeah. That was 2011, 2012. Yeah. 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 Time frame. So you see the potential, you're like, okay, marrying the, the the game world. I remember Second Life and it, it, it was, it made headlines because of the concept, but ex excellent point that it's just, it was hard to to get past it at an interface and how to use it. And and you say, you see the potential. So you, you say, yeah, I'll I'll lead this. And so that begins in in some ways the, the journey. Help me walk through what, what happened from there. Yeah, so, so once uh, I was made the CEO, the first thing I did was pivot to be to be, I said, look, unless we raise a lot of money, uh, we are not going to become, um, you know, Rosetta Stone, for example. Um, we need to focus on a, an enterprise proposition. And I think we should focus on two sectors. We should focus on oil and gas, and we should focus on aviation. And so we created this. How'd you get, we'll come up with those two? Because oil and gas, um, it, you have the, the, the operating um, areas for those businesses typically are remote, um, difficult to get sort of get people to travel in and out. So you, you're offshore or you're some you know, oil field in, a, in an inhospitable place, um, international workforces. So a, a real need to be able to communicate effectively in, in English. Um, and then obviously aviation, you know, there, there was a, you know, a use of simulation that has gone back many, many years and a need to communicate again, clearly in English. So a pilot communicating with someone in the control tower, for example. And so that was, that was my thinking. Um, and then the challenge was, okay, well, we need to find a client um, to be able to prove that this was a good idea. And then there was a business in it, to be frank. And I was already talking to potential investors and they said, yeah, Tom, we, we, you know, we like the, the concept. If you can win a client, then you know, we may put some money in the business, but uh, you know, we're, we're not gonna put money into a, your you know, fancy pipe dream. You've gotta, you've gotta prove that someone is gonna spend some money to buy this solution. And so that was kind of where we got to. And then within probably three or four months of, of kind of honing the proposition, creating a, a curriculum, identifying teachers, all that stuff, and building on Second Life a really slightly sort of babyish version of an oil refinery. I mean, 
it would make me wince if I saw that again today compared to what we're doing today, which is at a level of sophistication far removed. But the idea was that it was learning in context. And so long story short, we won Chevron as a client. They had, and this was their JV in uh, Kazakhstan, uh, TCO. Um, and they, uh, th their oil fields are in extremely um, inhospitable places. The Tengiz oil field in Western Kazakhstan, uh, very difficult to bring in, you know, a, an English trainer, there's a, there's a cost, you know, to, to bring in an English trainer. And then, and then is, you know, there's a calculation, well, do we really want to pay an English teacher to come in? We'd rather have, you know, the engineers for the people who are extracting uh the oil obviously so there was a compelling need to find a virtual solution that would allow an english teacher to be connected with a kazakh drilling engineer in real time but remotely uh, and of course you know a possibility might have been some sort of skype video based you know this is obviously the era pre-zoom um or um, maybe uh, this slightly funny sounding language lab guys, they, they're using avatars and gaming and anyway, long story short, we convinced them to run a pilot um, and the pilot went really well. We had great feedback from the Kazakh drilling engineers. And, you know, there, there was, as there always is with business, it's all about the timing. The price of oil was climbing to above $100. Um, Chevron saw a need to um, really emphasize language training because they thought, well, these Kazakhs are brilliant engineers, but they have quite poor English. If we could get their English to a, a better level, then we could put, perhaps take the, the Kazakh and put him in you know, the Gulf of Mexico, for example. So for a period of, a, I would say, about a year, suddenly language learning within TCO became a hot topic. Wow. Um, and we were, we were in the right place at the right time. And then, you know, we, we won a much bigger contract. And of course, that was allowed me to raise more money. And my investors were thinking, mm, OK, we made a smart decision here. Maybe Tom was right about this immersive tech meets learning and so that was all going really really well was it called immersed at this time as well so um uh, yeah we, we we had would we we were leaving language lab to become immersed um Got it. Around Got it. Just, there's um, no vr yet it's the idea of, of being in a a, a immersed reality just through a screen they're, they're obviously connecting to their computers and then still but it's a two-way talk it's, it's it's a live yeah it's live it's it's uh live voice um uh but with an avatar hmm. yeah, correct uh, and so kind of kind of cool um uh, and i think for a for a moment we were thinking well maybe they're maybe we just stick to languages and if because if we can win these big contracts uh, with with Chevron in Kazakhstan, then we can maybe get into Chevron in the Gulf, and you know that that was the thinking. Looking good on paper, suddenly the price of oil crashes to twenty five dollars a barrel. Uh, not quite so good. <laughs> so, so that was uh, um, yeah. I mean, and, and again, these things happen. You know, you and it, and it's really in those moments. Um, that, that kind of define you as an entrepreneur, as a team, can you survive, you know, effectively losing your only customer? How big was the team at this point? Uh, probably 14 people. Okay. okay. And we were, you know, when we were, when we won the contract, you know, it was a significant win um, in, in, in dollar terms. Uh, and so we were thinking, you know, so as you would, you're thinking, well, we're gonna scale up here. This is great. And then suddenly, oh, no, we better, you know, pare down uh, yeah. to survive. And, and investors then getting quite nervous, thinking, well, maybe this is not such a good idea. And so it was, 
it was really around that time that we were thinking, you know, because we we'd come off, we were just coming off Second Life at that time, onto our own platform. Ah, uh, okay. So we had a platform, a two D platform. Again, this is pre VR, but we had a two D platform that could deliver this multi user experience. So you could have multiple people as avatars in a space. And so lots of sort of accelerated thinking around, okay, we need to be a, a, a training platform, you know, just trying to be a languages, you know, we're, we're going from a, a sort of small training budget, which is a tiny percentage of overall training for health and safety, whatever it might be. So, um, and that, that was kind of 2015. Uh, and then, you know, they, we were not in good shape as a business by then we were really teetering on the edge invest i couldn't raise money because we just people said well yeah i like the idea but you know where's you know the revenue was was going down not up mm-hmm. and that's part of the challenge of, of always certainly raising money in europe you, you you are very much judged on you know the revenue uh, and the, there's a slightly different view i would say from what you might encounter um you know in the us or on the west coast so that's yeah, that's the reality you have to deal with. Um, what do you do then, next? <laughs> and, and then, well, then it's like, oh my goodness, this is, uh, we're, we're heading into the wall here. Oculus arrives on the scene, you know, the Rift came out, I think sort of end of 2015. Mm-hmm. And I said to my team, look, why don't we see whether we can incorporate the rift uh into our proposition and create something that's truly um 3d truly an immersive experience um and then see whether we can pivot and and sell that as the proposition but um you know by that time we were in very poor shape financially and you know close to going under anyway long story short you know, because I've got some brilliant engineers on the team, a brilliant um, co-founder in Justin, we were able to integrate VR, and then we were also able to win a first VR-based client in GlaxoSmithKline, and it was how can I use VR to disassemble a pill press? So rather than me, you know, classic, how is training delivered today or has been for 20 years, it's a mix of classroom and e-learning mainly. Uh, How could we show how VR could be used to really transform training? So winning that contract was, was, I suppose, in many ways, what saved the company. Uh, This is 2015, 2016, 2016? So that that was the, the the first few months of 2016. Okay, okay. So, you, so uh, the rift comes out. You see the opportunity. You were able to pivot. You, you if anything, a, a testament to your your salesman ability to 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 explain the idea, get the contract, 2016, and then you now focus fully on, on VR. Of course, of course. Mm-hmm. Because, um, we thought, wow, th- this is this is not just you know 2d avatar kind of cool kind of yeah this is this really is the transformative tech Mm -hmm. particularly for learning um and so the challenge then was to you know build the capability build out the platform win more clients but you know if i'm honest with you you know we, we had within the first three months we had this multiplayer vr platform you could have seven or eight people in vr simultaneously but we were way way too early way too early you know no you know trying to find an enterprise you know or a number of enterprises that were willing to put their foot in the water was super hard i mean it's not that easy today six years on but back then oh wow it's a tough sell really really tough sell you know, you could always, you always knew that if you could persuade someone to come to the office, put on the headset, they were always 
when they when they took the headset off of them, they went, "Oh my god, that is amazing!" You they know? get it. They get trying to to communicate verbally or written whatever the concept of VR and the power of it is doesn't quite work. It's only when you're immersed in it that the difference is there. Correct, and I and I think. Um, you know, I, I I could count on one hand. I mean, literally one hand over the last six years of people who who have been underwhelmed. I mean, everyone comes out thinking, "Okay, I see what you mean. Th this is yeah." So that's great. But then it's well, how are you, how do we implement this in our organization? And so the the kind of the, the how bit um it is really where we've been focused so how can we move you know a client who for whom you build a proof of concept um you know that's typically uh you know anything between two and six months to build some some kind of small subset that illustrates how we could potentially solve a problem so a part of a training program so your your route for you know, doing this is creating a simple pilot of of a small piece of the training that they can experience and see, and then you can build out from there. Correct. And so if I so imagine your shell, uh, and you're thinking, okay, yeah, this this technology looks like it's interesting. It looks like you know you can simulate different experiences. You can with this platform. Um, show how or you how you can deliver a training experience where the trainer does not need to be in the same place as the trainer that's a that's a big thing mm -hmm. but if your shell or indeed with any big enterprise you're going to say well who are these immersed guys i've never heard of them before you know they look tiny um that's you know look at their financials Ooh, they look like they're about to go out of business any minute you know like many early stage businesses so to try and convince them that you are worthy if you like uh of being able to work with them that you can understand their industry understand their challenges and that your technology does what you say it can do that's not a quick process believe me <laughs> it's really not Places. And that's really what your focus on your role is, is to, to make these types of conversations happen. Yeah, it, it is. Well, it was it certainly for those first sort of three or four years, it was me. And now, I, now I've obviously got a, uh, a really good team of people that are beginning to do that um, themselves. But there is, there is certainly an element, as virtual as our technology is, you know, in, a, in an enterprise solution cell, there there is still no substitute for you know getting on a plane or you know or train or whatever it is to travel to see the the prospect and look them in the eye and talk to them and you know that is part of the of the selling process so we with all the amazing blue chip clients we have that there is a there's a human element to it it's, mm. it's a small part, but it's a very important part. And of course, that, you know, when we think about the pandemic, you know, with me uh, and my team not being able to get in front of people for, for 20 months, that does make it hard, you know, the, there's a harder. Selling, selling during COVID it has its own challenges right there and marketing out, outwards. But it, did you see any uptick or interest, increased interest in virtual solutions or VR yeah. solutions? Of course, um, because I think everyone, you know, everyone is suffering from Zoom fatigue. Everyone. Uh, no one really is going to say, oh, no, I want to do, I want to run my whole business life on Zoom. Most, well, certainly most people who, who might be in a potentially customer facing sales marketing uh maybe product development role where there's some interaction is not going to want to do everything on zoom uh, other people you know a lot of my development team are quite happy working remotely because they don't need to have a huge amount of interaction i would say not not face to face mm -hmm. um so 
I think what we see is clients saying, well, the world of work is definitely evolving. It's never going to go back to exactly as it was. I think we've given people a taste of what virtual is like. And, the, and there's some really good elements to working virtually, as we've all um, discovered, you know, a bit more kind of work life balance which is a great thing um i i wonder if a lot of people are expecting now as far as employees and team members that to have that same freedom for that to stay and exist yeah i i think i think the 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 expectations are that my company needs to evolve uh, and they need to be offering me different ways of engaging virtually now some of that we're one of the things I think we're good at now at Immerse is, is being playing the role of trusted advisor with our clients. Uh, maybe in the early years where we were desperate to win money and, and generate revenue, we would have said yes to anything. Oh, you want to build there? Yeah, of course, of course we can do that. That's a great idea. Now, I think because we're you know, more expert and more, more confident, and the company's growing faster. For example, if someone said, I want to use your platform to run meetings, I would say, I don't think that's a great idea. Uh, I think if you just want meetings, sticking on a headset for meetings is not a good idea. That is not a good use of this incredible technology. You might want to... Well, what's interesting is when, I, when we look at said large company that's changed its name just recently... Uh, and their whole push for this metaverse uh, name in there. Um, they're actually trying to create these work rooms and where you'll, you'll go and, and meet with people. It's like there, there's these people that are trying it, but it's a lot of people that haven't figured out the best use case for, for an immersive uh, experience. But it's like you're, you're trying to play that role of educating where those places are best right yeah. now. That's right. Look, I think it's clearly wonderful that more people are talking about the metaverse or, you know, or talking about immersive tech and how things are evolving. That's clearly a, clearly a good thing because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a passionate believer in the technology, but applied to the right, you know, problem. Um, and so when we look at our, our current client base and the, and the problems that we are solving, that they're not about bringing people together in VR headsets. They are about delivering a training, a learning, an assessment experience that is valuable and engaging and effective where people's performance can be improved. Um, that's, that's what's exciting. And of course, it's brilliant to have companies like Meta uh, developing incredible hardware, of course. Mm -hmm. That is a that is a great thing because it's you know clearly the investment um, needs to be significant. So any that kind of the awareness is a great thing, and the investment they're making in the in the hardware is is a great thing. Uh, Ten billion dollars in in the next year to to go towards this. That's that's no small chunk. Yeah, I mean that's you know that's not within the you know the realms of every every company clearly. So we're you know we as a platform. Um, you know, we work with uh, all the main, main, I mean, today there's probably three main headsets that we would work with. Uh, we work with Oculus, we work with HTC, and we work with uh, Pico. Uh, and there's clearly going to be more manufacturers coming out over the course of the next six to 12 months because you know, there, there, there is a sense that this is not, this is not a throwaway technology. It is going to get to a point where there's a headset that actually <clears throat> is something that you can just slip in your bag and put on very quickly without feeling self-conscious in a public space. I mean, all that is clearly coming. You know, it's going to come in the next year, most likely. Are you, do you see for Immerse Exploring anything in the AR space or strictly focused on VR? Yeah, look, I, I think the big thrust of our strategy now now that we have you know a bank of amazing blue chip 
clients like Mars, Nestle, Shell, BP, now that we are, you know, the, the only VR play in the SAP store, you know, we, we've got that, we've established that credibility that this is a proposition that is here to stay and will only get better. What we're really interested in now is facilitating this content ecosystem using our SDK. Uh, and this is where the big push is. We'll, we'll continue to build content for our, our key clients. But what we really want to be able to do is go to you know, the small developer and say, look, you haven't got the platform, but why don't you use ours? You know, and then we can, we can collaborate around that. So there's already strong evidence of, of that. And so we're, we've just launched our new SDK, which sits on top of Unity. And, and the big driver of that is allowing people to create content quicker and you know, bring down the cost to their clients. So it's an SDK that has a lot of uh, existing interaction libraries. It draws on our six years of building solutions of our clients. So it's taking that intelligence and then putting it at the disposal of, of this developer community. And so we've already got 10 uh, developer companies that are creating content. And so what we're, what we're really excited about over the next sort of six months is building a library of existing content. And we see that as being a potential game changer because the biggest barrier to the growth of, of, of enterprise VR is really the cost. It's the cost of creating the content. And, and we think that if we can uh, go out there with a library of content, uh, and so for example, if you're working in a, you know, a manufacturing business, there's a certain suite of health and safety related um, programs that you will have to do. You'll have to do, for example, working at heights. Now, working at heights, is probably 80% the same across most businesses. There will be local flavors, local processes, procedures, maybe that are geographically related, but on the whole, there's a, there's a core that's the same. And so we think that if we can offer an off the shelf experience uh, at a minimum to get people to try it and say, come on, don't be scared. You know, this is just at least experience it, put it in the hands of some of your employees we can uh, we can start the dialogue so the, the creation of the library with our content partner companies we see as a as a really big step forward because it, it lowers significantly the cost of entry it, it, it's definitely multiple uh, lines of business model that, that allows you to do not just the content creation for you know one particular enterprise. You the fact that you now have this distribution method as well, and then coupling with your new SDK, others can develop and use your distribution method, uh, and then you creating a library of content made by you or others. Yeah, that just kind of levels up the the um, the options. And it's like when there are more options, there's then it increases the the maybe in the push for the enterprise say yeah okay well let's make an investment on the hardware side because there's it's much easier now to get uh, the content side yeah and i think that's right the distribution is a is a very key point because uh, everything that we build or our, our, our partners build can be delivered simultaneously to a headset to a mobile device or a pc or laptop so uh, for example um you know let's say we're doing a bit of health and safety training for an offshore uh, application, you could be in the headset. I could be coming in as we're doing today through our, you know, computers. Uh, we can. We've got real time voice. I can see everything that you're doing. I don't need necessarily need to be in the headset myself. And I and it was, and so that allows you know something that's much more accessible because at the moment as we know not everyone's got a vr headset in fact very few people have so what we're trying to do with our clients is say look you know don't stress about having to order five thousand headsets you can have much less than that you can have the person who is being trained or assessed in the headset where it's important that they truly are in the 3d environment but you as a trainer or, or as an assessor you don't need to be in the headset 
you can see you you can by the way record the experience in vr you can play it back you can analyze it i mean the platform is extremely sophisticated and as i said you know back six years ago ahead of its time um you know we we had a lot of this stuff in place when people were you know barely ready to get going now we're thinking and our clients are thinking hmm I really like the way that you can record that experience of someone in VR. It can be played back in VR or through the laptop. I can annotate where someone's doing something wrong. Uh, I can share it. I can keep it as a file from an audit perspective. These things are like super sophisticated and, and okay, we were, we were a bit too soon, but now our clients are thinking, mm, that's really useful. I can see, I can see the value in the platform. Mm -hmm. how, how big is the team today? We're about 45 people, um, mainly based uh, in the UK. We have some remote working, uh, but I think, you know, our scale will come from the partner ecosystem, you know, mm -hmm. so some of, some of the partners that we work with are creating content for us. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't expect, you know, we're not going to be hiring another hundred developers. We don't need to, because there are, yeah. there are solutions bigger than that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I think it's about this, it's sort of, it's trying to build this network effect. And there is amazing content being created around the world. We, we have within this new emerging partner ecosystem, you know, we have an incredible content company that's based in Peru, for example. Um, so that's really exciting, you know, really, really exciting. And it's empowering those companies, you know, through our SDK, through our platform to help them build their own business with their own clients. That's, that's what is really energizing us about, you know, the next sort of five years. With this, uh, platform and, and distribution and SDK, are you seeing not only uh, serving enterprise companies now, being able to serve mid-market or, or other? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that certain companies um, have not been able to move forward because often, you know, a proof of concept, you know, can probably cost anything between maybe sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 up to quarter, half a million. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of money. Some companies, you know, can afford that, but most can't. And so with the emergence of the library, you know, where you could say, you know, let, let's say I, I can buy a hundred confined space entry licenses for in the low thousands, you know, th th that is what is going to unlock the kind of the mid market um, and below. Um, so that that's where we see significant growth coming from uh so you know, look ahead i want to kind of land here for the for our final piece of the conversation is the future uh what do you see the future in like two to three years from now um what what is uh, immersive uh, vr training and, and experiences what is it going to look like well i the one of the things that excites me the most is choice you know it's giving customers small medium big fortune 500 the choice to implement xr content uh in whatever way they think makes sense and it's it's kind of empowering that growth in the market so you can deploy in a way that is adapted to your particular company's needs that's what uh, and i want immerse to be the hub of that that's what we're we're driving for we're, we're, we're all about empowering our clients by giving them the choice you know if they want to use our premium content creation of our brilliant team of people in the uk great they might want to use their own preferred content creator or they might say no actually i'm i want to use a bit of that off the shelf and then i might want to adapt it that is the right way to to proceed in in our opinion um voice is going to make the difference it is good I, it's, it's... I, look, I'm, I'm yeah I, i'm always going to champion choice i don't i think that kind of wall garden approach you know that where you try and own everything 
Yeah, okay, might work in some senses, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's really the right thing to be proposing uh, in a space that is moving so fast. Why do I want to be wedded to one particular company for my platform for my content? Just, it doesn't make sense. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, when we talk about the future, clearly, you know, a lot of it is related to, well, what is the device I'm going to put on my head? You know, who knows? Who's going to win that battle? Is there going to be one winner or are you going to see multiple different types of device? You know, that the, there will be more and more people coming onto the scene. As we all know, Apple are, you know, going to be bringing something out next year. Apple don't tend to launch bad products. You know, it's going to be, clearly it will be a device that, that is that looks great that's intuitive so I, that's really exciting we, we see that as a real engine of you know further driving you know awareness of, of what these kind of augmented technologies can can deliver so yeah look the future is uh the future is truly bright um I would say it's coming I, I love that you, you saw the future a long time ago second life and then and then you start to to, to, to push into VR still so, very early and in some ways we are early but not that early anymore it's almost like we're getting from the innovators to the some case maybe the early majority could could we, could we say that have we have we caught across the chasm now we've got to I, the early majority I, we've definitely crossed the chasm because I think the, the types of the, the evolution within our existing clients is, is proof of concept, big box ticked. We don't need to debate whether VR is good for training and assessment. It obviously is because of the way it engages. Um, so now it's how or how do we deploy it? And that that's, that's a much of, better question to, add, to dig into how instead of should we? Yeah, um, yeah much, much better. And as I said to you at the beginning, it's like, you know, when you're trying to convince Shell, when you're a tiny company, that to use this new technology that's only been out for a year, that, that's like super hard, super, super hard. Whereas now it's a, it's a totally different uh, discussion. Totally different space. Well, I've really enjoyed our, our conversation time. For those that uh, maybe you're a developer that has wanted to create something and can use the, the new SDK, if you're definitely enterprise, this is a platform you want to check out. Or if you're just an a individual in training, you're trying to keep your eyes open, this space is definitely evolving. For If you want to learn more, that you can head over to immerse.io. That's immerse.io. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Great. Well, thank you very much. I love the chat. Nice to do a bit of reminiscing, but uh, and also talking about the future. So thank you. We'll see you all on the next episode of Uptick Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know. Mm -hmm.